half decades of effective teaching and research in support of nation building. Creator of Conscious Citizens, architects of their existential arrangements, the University of the West Indies, deeply rooted in Caribbean civilization, prepared for 21st century service and rapidly rising as a first-class global institution. At 75, its reputation has never been higher, its global visibility has never been greater. Ranked in the top 1.5% of the world's finest 30,000 universities, it is on top of its game, number one in the region, and holding its head high with success. Dignified in its decades of struggle, these outstanding achievements are the results of an unwavering activist commitment to finding solutions to the region's challenges, social equality, economic development, democratic political reform, climate change, public health, sustainable energy, reparatory justice, and many other needs. It is an academy that has been persistent in its search of social upliftment, partnering with indigenous institutions, CARICOM, Caribbean Development Bank, Caribbean Examinations Council, and many others. It has produced and honed the region's finest leaders from the longest serving senior statesman, Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez, to the youngest and most recently elected, the Honorable Dickon Mitchell. It has benefited from the wisdom and vision of non alumni leaders, such as the Honorable Mia Motley, whose call for a new global economic order resonates in the corridors of its classrooms. As an activist university, it was selected in 2019 by the International Association of Universities to lead the Global University Consortium on Sustainable Development Goal 13, Climate Action, in recognition of its decade of distinguished research on climate change. In this role, it received commendation from the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change in the 6th Assessment Report. It is now recognized as the lead producer of research on small island developing states. Also, as an activist university, it has produced the leadership to build out an association of Caribbean universities, an organization of over 50 universities across the language terrain, unifying the higher education landscape of the Caribbean and driving the regional integration process. Rising to the challenge of COVID-19 management, the UWI mobilized its community of virologists, microbiologists, and epidemiologists to work with the health sector and governments to save lives. With sleeves rolled up, UWI scientists made their societies proud in their effective service. The leading research academy in the region, globally competitive, and ranked as excellent in the generation of new and relevant knowledge, center of gravity of the region's research culture, and host to its finest community of creative writers and artists. The soul and spiritual beat of the civilization. Today, the university sits at the pinnacle of the global reparations movement, seeking justice and a new development paradigm for the region. The world is on the cusp of a major structural transition driven by reparatory justice, an inspired development by CARICOM that calls upon the university to play its part. The university has proclaimed its intention to position itself as the epicenter of digital transformation for the region, building out the capacity for a knowledge economy that is rooted in digital science and propelled by corresponding technologies. The UWI at 75 energized for the future and focused on the region's needs at 2050. A public university, sustained by the financial and policy support of regional governments, always seeking to assure them of the positive outcomes of their investments. The UWI, five campuses hosting 50,000 students erupting over 75 years. The region's greatest gift to itself, an excellent ethical university, steeped in the struggles of its people and driven by their finest imaginings. Consolidating the past, the UWI now looks deeply into the future, focusing on claiming and owning that dignified place called the Caribbean world, sophisticated, sovereign and sustainable. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third installment of our series entitled Global Conversations. 
This evening, our speaker will be the Honorable Ambassador Dr. June Suma. Dr. June Suma holds a PhD in history from the University of the West Indies. She lectured at the UWI and universities in the US and worked at the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank between 1996 and 2006. She was St. Lucia's plenipotentiary ambassador to the OECS and CARICOM. With responsibility for diaspora affairs, and Secretary General of the Association of Caribbean States. Of note is that she was the first woman to hold these posts, as well as the post of the Chair of the Open Campus Council, a position she currently holds. Over the years, she has received many awards, including the St. Lucia Cross for Distinguished Service in the fields of education, diplomacy, regionalism and development, and the Order of Jose de Marcoleta in the degree of Grand Cross from the Republic of Nicaragua in the area of diplomacy in August, 2021. A tireless advocate for the global reparations movement, Honorable Ambassador Dr. June Suma is a founding member of the St. Lucian Reparations Committee and a member of the UN Permanent Forum for People of African Descent. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Honorable Ambassador, Dr. June Suma. Thank you very much and good evening all. My topic this evening is locating women in the reparations discourse, consolidating democracy and equality in the Caribbean. The burdens of history weigh heavily on Caribbean peoples as the social and cultural legacies of colonialism and slavery continue to shape their societies and the ways they think about them. O Nigel Boland in the politics of labor in the Caribbean. This statement certainly rings true for indigenous women and women of African descent in the Caribbean. Genocide, enslavement, and colonialisms have left, left structural barriers that limit female indigenous persons and female descendants of trafficked and enslaved Africans from inclusion and participation in the full social, political, and economic life in the region. Built on the ideology of racism, the inequalities have been perpetuated and driven by a number of coordinated fallacies, including that the extinction project was successful, thereby making invisible indigenous people. Another is that class rather than race origin was responsible for racial disparities and that both indigenous women and women of African descent were not victims but were, but were complicit in fostering the abusive, repressive systems that have repressed them to this day. For those who insist that enslavement was in the past and that no one alive was involved in that system, I want them to know that there is no statute of limitations on injustice. It is as if the Enlightenment term liberty did not apply to Haiti and its companion term equality does not apply to people of African descent. Like Bachman in The Guilt of Nations, I too believe that, and I quote, today's pain is a result of discrimination and past wrongs, and we must confront that pain openly. Let me thank the UWI Global Campus, the newly reimagined Open Campus, for the kind invitation to present the third lecture in the Global Conversations Lecture Series. I am indeed a proud UWI alumna, and my alma mater has certainly excelled in its 75 years of operations. I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate the university and the region for recognizing that tertiary education must be at the pinnacle of our sustainable development and I urge all to consider how much has been achieved in that short time and to continue to support the growth of our illustrious institution. The foundation and the context for what I will share 
has its groundings in the excellence produced by UWI academic stalwarts and luminaries, like the current vice chancellor of the UWI, Sir Hilary Beckles, Dame Udine Barito, Vereen Shepherd, Alvin Thompson, Rhoda Reddock, and the numerous scholars that have brought me to this point. By engendering the various spaces in which I was able to nurture my fascination with the role of women in enslavement and in the post-emancipation period, enabling a tracing of the lingering legacies of eras that still hold the identity of indigenous women and women of African descent in bondage today. I pay tribute to them for awakening my activism and guiding me towards expressions of the need for us to deconstruct the reparations discourse so that we can fully understand our demands for redress and healing. We need to understand that the expansion of our democracy and the equality of women in the Caribbean cannot take place in settings that accept colonial myths and definitions of these women. Eric Williams in Capitalism and Slavery understood that the European empires grew because of slavery and that the slave trade and the colonial expansions, expansions would further consolidate colonial power. This thesis changed the form of the fight for atonement, moving it from only focusing on the atrocities and brutality of the system by advancing the economic thesis of the rise of industrialization in Europe. This case had been made at various junctures in the ongoing reparations movement, but with capitalism and slavery, the connections were solidified and unapologetic. At this juncture, I posit that if females were the majority in the slave society, then the exploitation of women is equally responsible for the rise of industrialization in Europe. Much of this discourse will establish that women were at the center of indigenous community before the European carnage, and that much of the terrorism exacted against black bodies was directed at black female bodies. In 1981, Bell Hooks in Ain't I a Woman writes that scholars have been reluctant to discuss the oppression of black women during slavery because of an unwillingness to seriously examine the impact of sexist and racist oppression on their social status. She opines that while black men were exploited as field labor, the black female was exploited as a laborer in the field, a worker in the household, a breeder, and as an ob object of white male sexual assault. In other words, there was no one more exploited during slavery than a dark-skinned African woman. I make that specification because, except as punishment, white indentured women and lighter-skinned women were usually not considered as field hands. This is, of course, not to lessen the suffering of these women as domestics in the house or as nannies, for they were not automatically recipients of preferential treatment. And many suffered because of their constant proximity to the planters and their wives. In 1985, Rhoda Redock, in her article, Women and Slavery in the Caribbean, a Feminist Perspective, identified the foundation of many of the legacy issues involved in the control and oppression used on women internationally today. She concluded by utilizing the work of scholars such as Creighton, Hall, Patterson, and, the, and, the, and those that by abolition in the British colonies in 1838, the proportion of men in the fields had fallen below 40% that women were equal under the whip, that women worked just as hard in the fields and usually worked five years more, that women were excluded from jobs considered skilled, that they worked in the fields until their ninth month of pregnancy. And as noted by Kendall Hippolyte in his poem, Island in the Sun, there was no family, only crop after crop of children. As the ruling class, controlled, and I quote, the reproductive capacity of women to suit the economic necessity of the moment.
She elucidates that in all colonial enterprises, whether English, French, or Spanish, there were laws enacted to control women's production and reproduction. In 1989, Hilary Beckles, in his labor history, Natural Rebels, a social history of enslaved black women in Barbados, spoke to, and I quote, the intellectual inertia on the question of integrating the specificity of women's experiences into mainstream methodologies and theoretical constructs. He writes eloquently of the determination for repairing their inhumane conditions in other words, the need for redress and reparations, and notes the tenacity and the determination in their pursuit of social and material betterment in a search for freedom. We must stop treating with reparations as if the groupings called the enslaved was a generic grouping. Let us differentiate enslaved women whose experience was specific to them or not, and not just insert them into a conversation as if they were bystanders and not participants. In the 1995 publication, Engendering History, Caribbean Women, Caribbean Women in Historical Perspective, edited by Shepard, Brereton and Bailey, they speak to, to the paucity of writings by women and the fact that most of the writings was about women and that I quote, one is generally largely dependent on documentary evidence generated by men. These men who were colonizers and would set the stage for the continued exploitation of women. Take the case of former Chief Justice Thomas Atwood appointed to Dominica who in his, in his 1791 work, The History of the Island of Dominica, portrayed African women as promiscuous, uncivilized, immoral, and even eager to have their daughters sleep with the white men for their personal gains. He believed them incapable of maintaining stable relations. In this way, he enforced and constructed the idea that the, the idea of unrestricted access to the bodies of female slaves was a mere byproduct of their manifest destiny in the British colonies. While he wrote of, and I quote, the English white woman in the West Indies, as lovely as in any part of the world, besides, make as good wives, tender mothers, and agreeable companions. I posit that enslavement destroyed the image of black women and the patriarchal constructions of women's bodies perpetuated violence against black women that remains today. Over the last few years, I have been inserting the issue of reparatory justice for both indigenous and women of African descent into my lectures. And this presentation is a synthesis of a few of my thoughts on the matter. I posit that while in the works previously mentioned, there is an extensive and growing literature on women in enslavement, the specificity and central dialogue that is required for a complete narrative still remains suppressed by an anti-intellectual patriarchy that continues to undervalue the contributions of women. While the works, especially by persistent and dedicated inter intellectuals, has allowed us to look under the veil, this visibility should not presume that these women have been re-endowed with their humanity. This necessary focus must be undertaken within the reparations conversations as these oppressed women must be given the space to speak of the continued injustice that remains prevalent in persistent colonial societies and to move both to healing. Note that I did not say post-colonial societies as I hold on to the view that political independence alone did not make for post-colonialism. And in the words of Alvin Thompson, I quote, some territories are indeed still wearing the death shrouds of colonialism. I dedicate this presentation to the women in my family with a darker you, who continue to suffer discrimination because of a deferred mature conversation that we must have internally on the decolonization of the minds of the people of the region. It is a phenomenon that affects our politics, politics, 
as some are considered too black to represent our countries, that affects families and social structures as some are considered too black to marry, as progeny must pass the brown paper bag test and stifles our economies as some are considered too black to have any control of the means of production. I will therefore raise the issues surrounding mixing, miscegenation and the whitening phenomenon in a section entitled, The Whitening, The Shabine, The Browning, and The Notion of Good Hair. In my presentation, a previous presentation entitled, Stiff Back Spines, The Militancy, Defiance, and Plain, Plain Speaking of Enslaved Women in St. Lucia, where I noted that there was systematic approach, there was a systematic approach of dehumanization of African women which started in the 17th century and which set the tone for the continu continued devaluation of women of African descent to this day. I will continue to explore the systemic racism which has continued to dehumanize these women. While in the struggle for reparations in Latin America, I wrote that the colonizers did not come to the region with women and that we must address the myth that relationships with the indigenous women were consensual. We must continue to express the need for justice for the rape of indigenous women, which has been recorded widely as surrender. In the Magna Carta and the notions of rights in post-slavery, post-independence Caribbean countries, I explore the issue of chattel slavery rights and humanity did that the Magna Carta 20, um, 1215, the English Bill of Rights 1689, the American Declaration of Independence 1776, and the US Constitution 1789 were all being professed at a time when enslavement took away the fundamental rights of Africans as humans. It can be concluded, therefore, that Englishmen in England and in the colonies did not view natural and historic rights as an entitlement to Africans. The racist ideology which defined Africans as chattel would be the basis of the denial of all rights of humanity. I take the time to note here that chattel was not a gender neutral term and that if men were denied their humanity, Black women were considered even less and indigenous women were not even considered. I wrote, and I quote, that the violence of the system, however, never dulled the fight for human rights and a, def a redefinition as a person. So I explore women's resistance and the demand for reparations. The fight for that redefinition is still very much alive and that as stated in the Magna Carta, it's, and its various upgrades, even the king is not above the law, and so we must confront the king. As previously mentioned, chattel slavery was not gender neutral. A very vivid reality of this definition was an auction of enslaved people in the United States in the mid 19th century, which advertised two wet nurses as having much, and I quote, good milk and each with a cold and filly, a reference to the children. I took that from Alvin Thompson confronting slavery. Women were treated as reproductive chattel and labor chattel. The English themselves recognized the difference and sought in the late 18th and early 19th centuries to enact social laws that would encourage women to reprodu reproduce enslaved labor. Recalling, of course, that it was only enslaved African women who could reproduce an enslaved child. These laws became more prevalent as the end of the Atlantic slave trade was nearing an end. The European colonists did not equate the end of the trade with the end of the slave system. They therefore once again manipulated the reproductive capacity of enslaved women to replenish the labor supply on plantations and to develop a thriving internal trade across the various colonial countries. I also tackled the stifling patriarchy, which has been adopted as if it was a male-female divide, 
we have to discuss the race and class dimensions of this ascribed male-centered social construct whose evolution seemingly has given inclusion to white women who now have a significant role in its continuity as it is to their benefit. I ask myself whether governments in the Caribbean can effectively address the harm that has traumatized indigenous women and women of African descent in democracies that are still constrained by colonial constructs that continue to repress women. Perhaps it is time to recognize that the continued denial of rights of the descendants of enslaved women of African descent is entrenched in a never ending racist ideology that has been perpetuated by the same persons who promulgated democracy. In the discussion on repair and re renewal, how is the particular form of gendered harm being addressed? Can this be achieved through the integration of gender concerns into the conceptualization of reparations? I ask these questions because I do not want them to be a call for simply mainstreaming gender into the reparations dialogue, only because that mainstreaming may be a means of pacifying women or may accommodate the stereotypes of women of African descent without a consciousness of the racist masculinity that we have readily accepted in the 20th century and perpetuated into the 21st century. We should always remember, as noted by Kellogg, and I quote, that women have been creators of history, even if their voice do not survive in the historical record to the same extent as do men's, unquote. This analysis is widely supported volume edited by Ruth Rubio Marin entitled, What Happened to the Women? Gender and Reparations for Human Rights Violations which examined reparations for women in places where they suffered repression and violence during conflict, as in South Africa, Rwanda, Peru, and Sierra Leone. Her research focused on opportunities and strategies for reshaping the construction of women as citizens, including their claim to human rights. The Caribbean must also understand that it is a post-repression region and that we must deal with the trauma, especially as it continues to manifest itself in laws that have not been altered or updated so that rape in marriage in some of our countries is still considered legal and the age of consent is a shifting target as defined by those who remain in the control of women's bodies. Some people pretend that reparations is something new and that the enslaved and previously enslaved do not live amongst us, but let me make two points at this juncture. The first one was made by Mary Frances Berry in My Face is Black is True, Callie House and the Struggle for Ex-Slave Reparations. Berry writes, that, and I quote, it is worth remembering that thousands of ex-slaves devoted years to pressing the, the reparations cause, unquote, with very limited success. I would like to say that during the first phase of the movement, as noted by Hillary Beckles, the enslaved also fought for redress and repair. And, and I quote, only the form and the functions of the movement has changed since 1838. They sought reparations during enslavement in the post-emancipation period, in the early 20th century, in the post-independence period, and now in the 21st century. We have never stopped asking and never will. Reparations for Indigenous Women. The discourse on reparations must never leave out the Indigenous women. Their invisibility makes it almost impossible for them to seek justice, and it continues to relegate them to the purveyors of cultural trinkets in markets and by seashores. Being invisible in plain sight speaks to an invalidation, a conscious inhumanity that has placed hindrances in their progress. They too were dehumanized and have remained almost nameless and faceless. Paul Ramirez reminds us that, 
I quote, indigenous people remain invisible and uncentered because we continue to view them in the past tense. Snapshots of time and that little value is placed on the lives or knowledge of modern indigenous people by outsiders. And this de these devaluations fit into the languages and practice of continued genocide against indigenous people." Unquote. Suzanne Kellogg, in Weaving the Past, A History of Latin America's Indigenous Women from the Pre-Hispanic Period to the Present, writes, quote, the full range of male-female relationships and violence committed specifically against women occurred early in the Caribbean, where informal relationships marriage and sexual coercion and rape all took place." Unquote. Women were used as a tool of conquest. She writes that, quote, while it might be going too far to say that rape was a consciously used strategy, strategic tool sorry, in conquest and colonial rule, that sexual coercion was part of the process of Iberian exploration and conquest cannot be denied. Beckles articulates in Britain's Black Death Reparations for Caribbean Slavery and Native Genocide that the genocide against indigenous populations, the sexual plunder of their women by imperial soldiers, and the appropriation of their wealth by merchants and military leaders preceded the mass enslavement and also highlights the damaged psychological, social, and material legacy on them and their progeny. Noteworthy is the fact that the only mention of any significance of Kalinago women relates to their marriage to white French or English colonists. Otherwise, they simply belong to that polydefined group of original inhabitants called Caribs. One can infer, however, that in this group, women held esteemed positions as marriage by colonists to a Carib woman made the negotiations of peace an easier prospect. For example, in 1651, Governor Dr. Paquet, brought, having brought Saint Lu, bought St. Lucia from the French West Indies Company, sent a French officer to head the settlement building of the island. According to Reverend Father Charles Jess in Peeps into St. Lucia's past, quote, having married a Carib woman, he was likely to be accepted by the Caribs of St. Lucia. And so it turned out. This nameless Carib woman would clearly begin the invisibility of women in St. Lucian history and in all the histories of the region. Among the Kalinago people, the women were not helpless. They could use the bow and arrow, just like the men, and were also involved in the preparation for wars. They prepared the food for war missions and acted as lookouts, providing warning of approaching enemies to inform war strategies. They too were equal under the whip. They too have been undervalued, raped, and enslaved in countries that were their own. James Baldwin's painful utters, quote, my grandmother was not a rapist, if only to emphasize that the, race, the rapists have been validated while the victims remain oppressed. They rape not only the inhabitants, but the land, the environment, and also their progress and their future. It is our duty within the reparations movement to give dignity back to the wounded, particularly to the women. It is our duty to uproot the misrepresentations of these women as second-class citizens. We must never forget that disease crossed the Atlantic 16th century and that the first recorded smallpox outbreak in Hispaniola occurred in December 1518 or in January 1519, and that this epidemic killed 90% of the indigenous people who had not already perished. If the demographics are accurate, the Taino nation comprised a majority of women who remained in the communities while the men went out to hunt and fish. So they were most affected by these diseases. 
we must seek reparations for the intentional spreading of disease, a very pertinent subject in the post COVID-19 period. The image of black women. In Mammy, Sapphire and Jezebel, historical images of black women and their implications for psychotherapy Carolyn M. West wrote in 1995 that there are three stereotypes that have been used to image women through history, culture, and in the media. The first is the highly maternal, family-oriented, and self-sacrificing mammy. The second is the threatening and argumentative sapphires. And the third is the seductive, sexual, sexually irresponsible, promiscuous Jezebels. Each of these stereotypes have their own distinctive features. The mammy is the obese woman with darker complexions and body, hair texture, and skin color issues. The author posits at this point that, and I quote, women's beauty image has historically been based on their blue eyes and fair skin, the ideal type of Nazis and white supremacists. Sapphire is the antithesis of Mammy. She is considered a nagging fishwife, aggressive, as opposed to assertive. She is loud mouth and animated, of brown complexion, and large but not obese. In recent vernacular, she is the angry black woman. The final type is Jezebel, which I quote originated during slavery. slavery when white slave owners exercised almost complete control over black women's sexuality and reproduction, unquote. She is the one with the childbearing capacity and able to withstand the rape she endures. She is portrayed as a seductress and hypersexual. This image has perpetuated the abuse of the black female body while attributing the blame on the victim. West concludes, that black women could be perceived as combinations of any of these types. What is clear, however, is that these imposed stereotypes have been internalized by black women and have affected the self -image, their self-image, while other women may be described for their intellect or their grace. The black female body is demeaned by anyone who chooses to do it. In my body is my piece of land, female sexuality, family, and capital in Caribbean texts. Sandra C. Duvivier, in her examination of the portrayal of the exploitation of women's bodies in novels, points to how, and I quote, Euro-American perceptions of the body particularly the black female body as a hypersexual entity for public consumption, largely shaped its sexual and economic marginalization global and globally and nationally, unquote. She posits that neocolonialism and the fight for global survival has forced many Caribbean countries to exploit and commodify the black female body in carnivals and the tourist industry as they fight for the tourists. Further, that women thinking that they have, further with women thinking that they have agency over their bodies, allow the exploitation. Yet the appropriation of the black female body in the syringes and scalpels of plastic surgeons has become acceptable on females of a different complexion. We forget the story of Sarah Bartman who spent her childhood and teenage years on Dutch European farms in South Africa. She was put on show as a freak of nature because of her ample posterior as part of ridicule and commodification of black women. Natasha Gordon, who examines the phenomenon surrounding the representation of black women in her book, Representation and Black Woman Womanhood, remarks that, and I quote, Sarah has become the landscape upon which multiple narratives of exploitation and suffering without, within black womanhood have been enacted, unquote. Now all women try to accentuate this, 
and we are, we are happy to admire and marry them. But I remind you, before JLo, there was Sarah. Reparations for women's work. The European colonists wrote that the Garifuna women labored on the land. In the text, they were described as the, quote, hard-backed women who could quietly bear the pain of childbearing, unquote. After they were exiled to Roatan, they were responsible for the communities while the men left to earn wages and sometimes left home for six months. This is also the documentation that these women, there is also the documentation that these women never worked for wages. Instead, they sold the cassava bread and the poultry they, rose, they raised in the markets, some of which were 40 miles away. We want reparations for every mile walked with the goods on their heads. Sheena Boy, in the experience of women estate workers during the apprenticeship period in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 1834 to 1838, notes that at emancipation, women made up the majority of the field laborers in St. Vincent and many other islands. Should also add that the greater strat gender stratification that denied women's skills continued and reinforced that women were to be relegated to work in the fields and domestic work in the homes. Moreover, women were most likely to be classified as predial workers in order to exact two more years of work from them. This assessment points to the attempt to control the labor of women after emancipation and the consideration by Anthony Phillips in Emancipation Betrayed Social Control Legislation in the British Caribbean, that in pursuit of social control of labor, the decision makers devised a series of interlocking tactics points to the need to further understand how these majority worked on female workers. In addition, according to Nigel Boland, one of the most characteristic features of the history of the Caribbean societies is the prolonged and pervasive nature of colonialism and labor coercion. Associated with the extreme social inequalities and injustices in an extraordinary degree of authoritarianism in personal as well as in labor and political relations. What was the impact of this prolonged coercion on bodies of these women? And how did these inequalities become normalized in the post independence period? By not delving deeper into the numbers and the analysis of these laws on women who were not a minority, we will never understand the continued legacy of oppression against them. The significance really is giving voice to the many women who labored, primarily in the fields, but also in the houses, nurseries, and hospitals. Women whose names would never be uttered. There were numerous grievances, especially over wages, conditions of work, and the amount of work. And this would soon result in a series of labor protests throughout the region. In riots triggered by the flogging of a 14-year-old female occurred in 1844. The imposition of land taxes on small landholders in 1849 caused even more protests in that island. From the Bahamas to the British to British Guyana, protests over the living and working conditions were pervasive and would reach their crescendo in the Moran Bay Rebellion in Jamaica in 1865. Boa, in, in, in highlighting the experiences of women apprentices in St. Vincent, notes the indignities they suffered. She writes that, and I quote, many women withdrew from estate work as soon as they were fully free and chose instead to concentrate on growing and marketing provision crops. The local legislature, however, legislature in St. Vincent, however, insisted on retaining the flogging of women in its new slave codes. 
And although it would become legally discontinued in 1838, when full abolition came, it was clear that during the apprenticeship that women continued to be flogged throughout the region. In the first year of apprenticeship, for example, one magistrate in St. Vincent and the Grenadines sentenced 268 men and 307 women to extra labor. In addition, 36 men and 55 women had sentences of extra labor as well as additional punishment. Another magistrate sentenced 144 men and 172 women and nine gangs of laborers to extra labor in the same year. This policy of adding years of labor and imprisonment was consistent with the colonial government establishing more prisons on the eve of emancipation, reinforcing that freedom would forever be linked to criminality. The fact that there were more women in these jails meant that women had to internalize that the defense of the oppressive system would always be criminalized. There remains a direct link of criminalizing Black women in places like the United States, where more women of African descent are incarcerated. Reparations for women's resistance. From the Tainos to the Kalinagos to the Garifuna to the enslaved Africans to the Maroons, indigenous women and enslaved African women have been at the center of the resistance movement. While there is still a major gap in the literature on the anti-slavery ideology of enslaved females in the smaller territories, Beckles and Shepard have given us an overview, overall extensive view of their resistance. In conflict zones like St. Lucia, women were a major part of the wars. Jess, Jess writes that in this period, I quote, the French then had in the island some 400 men fit to bear arms and maybe four times that number of women and children. They were also active in maroon societies. And according to Hanson, Ellis, and DeVoe, I quote, maroon women grew various crops, including cassava, corn, cucumbers, dashing, papaya, peppers, plantain, pumpkin, and sweet potatoes, and tanya. They faced the same dangers of, as men, whether from the elements in dangerous terrain, from snakes and scorpions, and from the weapons of the British military, while at the same time caring for their meal, their makeshift homes, and wearing, rearing their children. There is presently a great deficiency in the literature on female runaways in the Caribbean. The focus of the available data is on male maroons, with a few interjections on some female runaways. I argue in, uh, in my article, a brief respite from female runaways and their survival in the Caribbean, that one of the main reasons for this deficiency is the perception that volume is more important than the ways in which freedom was acquired and maintained. The fact is that there's no clear picture of the number of female runaways can be developed by a simple headcount assisted by slave advertisements. Neither should a value be placed on petite marronage in which more women participated as opposed to grand marronage in which more male slaves participated. The data will show that men were facilitated in their bid for permanent freedom, freedom by many of the networks established by female, enslaved females. Enslaved women use all forms of resistance against enslavement. Stephen Small and James Walvin in African Resistance to Enslavement note that African women were more likely to resist by talking back to slave masters and overseers. Enslaved women had a rebellious fighting spirit on the plantation. They did not meekly accept their lives as slaves in the British Caribbean. Their resistance took many forms and in Dominica, running away and marronage were important and typical manifestations of their rebellion. Even given the, uh, the emergency, sorry, the emergency of being hunted and slaughtered, slaughtered by the British planters and legions, 
the speed with, with which the maroon communities developed in Dominica was also due in large part to the large number of women in the camps and the extensive cultivations they achieved in the maroon camps. During the Dominican Maroon Wars, nearly one third of the 577 Maroons officially listed as executed between 1813 and 1814 were women. Let us fill the gaps on women's resistance so that we better understand the call for reparations for women. The whitening, the shabin, the browning, and the notion of good hair. During enslavement, rights were conferred according to economic status and skin color. It is therefore not surprising that there was an elaborate color grading aimed at not simply conferring privileges, but as a means of dividing people of African descent. Whitening became government policies in places like Brazil and other Latin American countries and have assisted in perpetuating the myth of multicultural societies that embrace all cultures. This colorism has been designed to give legitimacy and deniability to the open racism that sustains hierarchies and exclusion through a cultural lens. Writers like Nidelman and Nascimento propose that whitening hinder development of a civil rights and reparations movement in these countries. And I posit that it also created challenges for the Caribbean reparations movement with the aspirations to bleaching them into whiteness. This system was perpetuated itself in the post-slavery, post-independence period. And it is amazing that skin color is as relevant today as it was during slavery. I recall a conversation I had as a teenager with a father of one of my friends who told me that when he left to go to study overseas, his parents made it clear that he had to return with a white wife. His mobility and acceptability and that of his children would be dependent on his ability to whiten his family. This attitude still remains with parents, even today, trying to remove Africa from their lineage. The thinking is that if the skin of the race is whitened, we will, we will erase our Africanness, but it is only a lack of understanding of the mosaic that is Africa. You may leave Africa, but Africa never leaves you. To paraphrase Henry Louis Gates, you cannot keep hiding the black great grandmother in the closet. One of the phases in the dehumanizing of the enslaved woman was the elevation of the white woman and later lighter skinned women. Recall that during the early colonial period that upper-class white women did not come to the West Indies. Most of those who came were from the lower classes, some were criminals and others prostitutes. Some came to seek their fortunes while others came in search of employment or marriage. However, soon purification and an ultimate deification was achieved through marriage to wealth. These women, women would soon embody the persona of fragility and femininity. This was compared to the robust sexuality of the African woman with the childbearing hips and full breasts. I maintain that this concept would justify the continued rape of African women and their female offspring. This also would be responsible for the notion of the cerebral white woman it naturally followed that if the, if the African woman was a physical being, then surely the white woman was the thinking human being. And by the 1660s, as white female assumed the status of Mrs. African women became the symbol of physical, sexual, emotional, and other forms of exploitation. This would continue to the present day where dark-skinned women of African descent until recently were not the faces of our bank tellers because they were not pretty enough or they were pretty for a black girl. Not surprisingly, the glass ceiling is based on both gender and race and continues to, to entrench inequality based on colorism. Those who manage to achieve even if the, these restrictions must prove themselves over and over again if they are more learned, even if they are more learned than their white male and white female counterparts.
the memory of the trials of Katanji Brown readily comes to mind. Then we must tackle the notion of good hair and the impact that it has on our psyche. I listened to the TEDx talks presented by Joanna Lukit on the psychology of black hair. In her examination of a Yale University study where the image of people were presented to a group of to determine their perception on issues like confidence, intelligence, attractiveness, and self-centeredness, she concluded that, and I quote, our impression of a woman's intelligence is dependent on her hairstyle. She also deduced, and I quote, for women of color, hairstyling from chemically relaxing to covering your hair with a wig or deliberately wearing it as an Afro is about managing a marginalized identity. Unquote. She adds, it is styling your hair with the understanding that you're not just judged by what is in your control, but you are judged by the physical attributes given to you at birth, such as the color of your skin or the texture of your hair. Walk tall African women, you are after all the first humans to walk upright. So our societies our school, and our schools, even at this stage, punish us for not having good hair, even when we have glued or gelled each stubborn curl into a forced pattern. Long straight hair remains acceptable when, when long coil locks, no matter their cleanliness, remain taboo. Let us address this legacy and stop the legislating of control over female hair breaking down patriarchy. A better understanding of patriarchy would ensure a deeper understanding of the legacy issues which face women of African descent in striving for equality. Patriarchy was learned from white colonies. So in many ways, black men in the post MN period applied what they learned from white patriarchy in dealing with the female counterparts. Caribbean men must realize that their power cannot be built on the subordination of the rights of women, especially when these women labored with them in the cane fields, the cotton fields, and in the mines. Patriarchy is a social contract and can be revised with true consciousness. It is important to point out that during enslavement and colonization, that patriarchy, patriarchy had control over women's and women's labor. Further, that capitalist patriarchy is rooted in capitalism, colonialism, racism, capital extraction, and accumulation. Before 1800, most women were prevented from having children because of the loss of, loss of labor during pregnancy. We have already noted that this changed with the advent of the end of the slave trade. So female fertility was always seen as controlled by white men. We must explore patriarchy in all its facets as it is entrenched in our education system. And unless we decolonize that, decolonize that system, women will never fully participate in democracy and will never have equality. It is entrenched in our legal system, which discriminates against women. It is time for the CCJ, which has demonstrated its ability to, to decolonize the legal system tackles these discriminatory legislations. I have already mentioned the issue of marital rape, but there are other restrictive social orders that deny women equality. Male planters gave their daughters gifts of women and girls of African descent. So mammies belong to them and they could own them for life. These daughters, mothers and women were schooled into believing that they could own a human being they would exploit both men and women as this was the only area in their lives in which they could wield power. They learned how to use patriarchy to garner their own power. Maria Mize in Patriarchy and Accumulation on a World Scale, Women in the International Division of Labor, writes that there must be a recognition that, and I quote, patriarchy and the accumulation on a world scale constitute the structural and ideological framework within which women's realities today has to be understood. And that today this colonial relationship 
is upheld by the International Division of Labor. This relationship is not only often eclipsed in the consciousness of white feminists, and I change feminists to women, so in the, in the consciousness of white women whose standard of living also depends to a large extent on this ongoing colonial relationship. It should also be noted that black women are also divided by capitalist patriarchy along colonial and class lines and class division in particular is often forgotten in the discourse on sex and race. So black women of all shades are divided because colonialism has taught them that their class is also dependent on this patriarchy. She writes that the term patriarchy is used because it enables us to link our present struggles to a past and thus gives us hope that there will be a future. If patriarchy has a specific beginning in history, she adds, it can also have an end. I add, that likewise, that if colonialism had a beginning, we have to work towards its end. Rhoda Redox's work on women showed the diametrically opposed value system applied to white women and enslaved women. And she writes, and I quote, slave women in the Caribbean for long women were not allowed to marry or to have children. It was cheaper to import slaves than to pay for the reproduction of labor. At the same time, the bourgeois class domesticated its own women into pure monogamous breeders of their heirs, excluded them from work outside the homes and from property. Patriarchy is a complex construct which our, our scholars must examine as they delve deeper into the research on reparations, as it too will give a more comprehensive understanding of why reparations for indigenous women and women of African descent. Locating women in repair, redress, and healing. As the reparations movement in the Caribbean reflects on the 10-point CARICOM reparations plan, there must be a consciousness surrounding each facet of the plan. I agree with Beckles that it cannot be concerned with the absurd task of simply adding women to history, but directly with the need to restore history to women. For example, the treatment of African women, African women, women of African descent in the health care sector, especially with regard to maternal health and the treatment of their babies, is something in the past, but is in living memory, especially as it continues to be the reality in some countries. In Black women's experience in, in slavery and medicine, Deidre Cooper Owens explores how medical doctors practice medicine on black, black women's bodies as did slave owners who form close relationships with these medical men. This documentation of the numerous medical experiments and surgeries on black women are also notable for their lack of the use of the anesthetic because as she writes, I quote, the black female body was further hypersexualized, masculinized, and endowed with brute strength because medical science validated these ideologies. These myths led to the prevailing notion that enslaved women were impervious to pain. Tales abound about black, swim, black women inability to feel physical pain. Do you understand why I call for us to understand enslavement in its entirety? She concludes her article by stating, and I quote, that the, rec the records of the sexual abuse of black women are voluminous and sources evidence how some enslaved suffered physically from many of these brutal sexual encounter encounters with white men and sometimes fellow enslaved men. Do you understand why I ask for reparations for enslaved women? This discourse in no way diminishes, diminishes the sexual abuse of enslaved men and boys by both white men and white women. I have to point out that women of African descent 
however, continue to face more discrimination with regard to health services and the intersection, because of the intersection of racism and health inequalities because of their race and gender. The UN publication on maternal health on women and girls of African descent in the Americas only this year states that descendants of the African victims of the transatlantic and Mediterranean Sea slave trade have the following findings. One, Afri Afro-descendant women and girls in the Americas are disadvantaged before, during, and after pregnancy. Afro-descendant maternal deaths in particular are alarmingly high in both absolute terms and when compared to those of non-Afro-descendant and non-Indigenous women in the region. Structural racism and sexism are evident in maternal health disparities that exist across income levels and national and regional bodies. Racism and discrimination by medical providers increase the likelihood that women and girls of African descent will experience mistreatment in maternity care. So when you thought that this was in the past and we should forget about it, this reports point to how systemic racism continues to affect women and girls of African descent. Let us include women in the discourse on health and all the other aspects of the plan to be revised, as well as in their own right. In conclusion, in all my lectures on reparations, I call for the mention of the names of enslaved women. My goal is to collect as many female names and, and their estates according to islands. By naming them, we will start to bring back the humanity. Unfortunately, the task is even more difficult for indigenous women who have remained obscure unless they were associated with a colonizer. My call for a specific examination of the particular experiences of these women is for us to understand that the redress and repair that we seek is underestimated if we leave them out of the discourse. I do not seek polarity, I seek enlightenment. After reading chapter six in Britain's Black Debt, entitled Prostituting Enslaved Caribbean Women, I want you to join me in calling for reparations for Black women who were systematically raped just because they were not owners of their own bodies and who continue to suffer violence because of stereotypes and myths that continue to dehumanize their Black bodies. Reparations for women who were bred to replenish slave stocks and whose children were sold to other local plantations and to other plantation systems in other countries. Reparations for women who are at the bottom of the slave system because they were black and female and who have remained in that position because of an entrenched patriarchal system that keeps dark skinned women from being called beautiful. Reparations for all the women who have not been recognized for their role in dismantling enslavement through their constant and persistent resistance and who have to continue to be classified as angry because who, she who feels it knows it. So I leave you with a few names. 12-year-old Mary Catherine, who ran away from her owner, David Delisle of Grosile St. Lucia. Member Juba, Fanny Ann, Jamima and Little Dolly, who were impregnated as young as 13 years on the Newton plantation in Barbados. Catherine for Akei, who served as the flag, who sowed the flag for the Haitian Revolution. Madeleine Lacheney, known as Jujut, she was the official advisor of Petio. Jacona, who was a writer and dancer and chiefess of the Jawakwa. Her name meant golden flower in the language of Haiti's indigenous people, well known for her talent in crafting poetry. Petronil of the Fondo estate who was murdered in resistance during the amelioration period. At a trial, Mr. Du Bocage, the estate's Overseer observed 
this Negro woman will not do anything for me. Jeanette, the Creole enslaved woman who escaped from St. Pierre Martinique and escaped to St. Lucia. The advertisements for her return to Barbados described her as a stout, well-made Negro wench named Kwashiba with a scar on her right hand. By the time they captured Kwashiba, she was living in St. Lucia and speaking Creole. Then there was Beauty, the wife of the daring Maroon chief Apollo in Dominica, who supplied him with guns and gunpowder from the plantations. And female Maroon leaders like Sarah from Hillborough's estate in Dominica. These are but a few. The dialogue around reparations for indigenous women and women of African descent is poignant because it forces us to confront a legacy and a colonial value system inculcated over centuries of white supremacy indoctrination. It is, however, essential for us as we move forward, for us to with sustainable development as a equality of women impacts all facets of life. Let me read that again. It is however essential as we move forward with sustainable development as the equality of women impacts all facets of life. We often speak of decolonizing our minds. We must start with these difficult conversations we are grown enough for these dialogues. Courage, I thank you. Ambassador. Um, very, very deep conversation, extremely deep conversation. I, I am known to take notes um, in meetings, in lectures, in simple dialogue sometimes. And, and I can tell you that I sat here and wrote three pages of notes from your, your conversation just now. I, I, I think I am better able to locate women such as myself in the whole reparations discussion. Um, I am able to see with um, clearer vision the the reason or the 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 rationale behind um certain terminologies used now in 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 speaking of women in describing women seeing the history behind that and 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 grappling with that even as i think of how um currently with the world that um the world games going on in Budapest and listening to commentators, I am extracting from that some of what you are describing. This is, this is deep. And right now I am opening the floor for questions from colleagues, from viewers, from anyone who um, just wants to make a comment or even just yeah, just to ask a simple question about what we just heard. I am. I'm looking for questions in our chat. And asking our team to just let me know um i'm not i can, i'm not able to see them real time but asking my team to just alert me whether or not there are any questions here okay i'm seeing that there are no questions at present from our facebook or utv.org are there any questions from our our persons in the zoom Zoom room. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ambassador, I I have to say thank you. I 
have learned so much. I have learned so much. And I know that the persons online or viewers on, on Flow TV, those persons on Facebook, and I mean, they're in the same position as myself. I'm just totally blown away by some of the information when, when, I, when I listen to you just now. And I think of even the three descriptions that they, you, you highlighted of the black woman, the mommy, the Sapphire, and the Jezebel. And it is so real. It doesn't sound like something from that time. It sounds very real and present, you know, because I was able to identify some of those, um, I would say, personalities. But you see how, 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 how you, you came to those um, kinds of descriptions. Just, I suppose it's inherited um, a, 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 a terminologies that were passed down and you could identify people you know through those 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 words the mommy the overweight dark-skinned woman who you know she was motherly she she was um um caring and the mother of you know and then sapphire the nagging loud mouth animated you know not so dark-skinned woman and then the jezebel childbearing capacity seductress light skin blamed for her own rape and, and abuse you know um and 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 all of that it's it's it is profound i must say and i have to say big thanks to you ambassador very i mean i am grateful for for this for this um conversation this global conversation um i want to thank all the persons who attended both online those on zoom those on uetv flow or flow channel and those on facebook thank you so much for taking the time um, we will continue the global conversation the global conversation series until december and i would urge you to look out for our notices and so on our distinguished speaker honorable ambassador dr june suma i'm so grateful and i thank you so very much for taking the time to prepare this um profound presentation i must say for me it is it is profound and i'm sure it is the same for many others as well as i say i have all of three pages of notes just listening you know things um things i've learned i'm learning now and it is it is really um creating uh I, I don't know, I have an understanding for me. So that is that is where I am. It it has it has given me an understanding of 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 my own history, you know. Yes. Very, very real and and profound. So thank you so much. Thank you, viewers. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Anything